Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask that you continue to establish your word in our lives. In the beginning was your word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we ask, oh God, that you continue to reveal more and more of your word, more and more of Jesus in all his fullness. Even as we look at the life of Jesus tonight, and we begin to appreciate all that he has done, we ask that the eyes of our understanding continue to be enlightened and open, that you continue to reveal all the fullness of your grace, that we may bask in the glory of his presence. Thank you, Father. We bless you. In Jesus' name, for all that you are. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, let's look at the... Uh, <coughs> okay. Sorry, the angel says worship a bit more, so... <coughs> yes.
Father. Strengthen the angels in our midst. Strengthen the hearts and minds of your people. Let the Holy Spirit's way be known among us, Lord. Thank you, Father. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. There is what I call a certain atmosphere in the spirit, not, not an emotional atmosphere, but a kind of atmosphere that is needed for uh, certain things to flow, like teaching anointing, ministry anointing, and you will understand it as we look at Luke chapter 2, as to what Jesus is, and in the whole of Luke chapter 2, what we're going to consider tonight is, uh, as we look at Luke 2, is the early life of Jesus, and it is the only record that we have of the early life of Jesus, although supernaturally the Lord has shown some other things about his life that are not recorded in the Bible, about his uh, three altar building trips that he did in his 20s, uh, that was not shown in the Bible, but uh, we're going to see whatever the Bible has recorded and learn from the early life of Jesus because that's the one part of his life that has some similarities to our Christian life. Amen. So here we are and uh, in chapter 2 and not much uh, of a variation in translation just a small little bit only. When you come to stories there's not much differences when you translate uh, just minor areas. Says, uh, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this registration was first made when uh, Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, everyone to his own hometown or city. What a, what a plain was. Look like you're reading uh, something from the newspaper when you look at this part. But behind it is a lot of arrangement by angels. Because in order to bring Joseph and Mary all the way to the hometown of theirs in Bethlehem, the angels have to time it properly. There's a timing involved. Because Mary must give birth. It is not optional. She must give birth in Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy. Cannot even give birth halfway. Then you're outside Bethlehem. Because there is a prophecy when you read on. Uh, it just so happened. <coughs> In verse 4 to verse 7, it says that uh, Joseph went out from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth because that is where he is at the moment, where his business was, and where he was living, into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife. She was pregnant. It came to pass, in fact the word pregnant in a, in a Greek, which I didn't want to go to because it's not a real, real relevant point, means uh, uh, she was really sizable, <laughs> a big size. So I can imagine that uh, when she was really, it says that she was full, which means that it's full term. <clears throat> she came to full term. And uh, it was visibly pregnant. It's like the, the Greek word, I mean, she's really swollen up. <laughs> really, really big. And remember, Mary, uh, there's no picture of Mary and all that. But assuming that uh, she was what her age was, that she, she was in those days, she was not a very necessarily big sized lady and all that. Of course, uh, we all now wondering, I wonder how much Jesus weighed, because they always weigh the babies. Uh, in those days, they don't weigh the babies. I and mean, what was Jesus weight when he was born? <clears throat> I assume that <clears throat> being a creation of the Holy Spirit, he has to be perfect, and there's an environment around her, and she would be, you know, full. 
And uh, so here's this uh, slim little girl, suddenly she's full, and uh, you can mean, you now it's not easy to walk, and she was really pregnant and ready to give birth. It came to pass that when they were, uh, while they were there in Bethlehem, <coughs> the days are completed that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So we wait for until that part. You know how many miracles are involved in that? That uh, so many people to go back to the hometown. It was a decree in the whole Roman Empire. A census was taken. The angels were involved. And the timing of the angels have to be such that it was exactly when she went back to the hometown during those few days that Jesus gave birth to fulfill the prophecy that mentioned in the uh, Gospel of Matthew mentioned a prophecy that the king must be born, the, the Messiah must be born in Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy. So there were a whole group of angels invisible to us they were working on that. And when Joseph and Mary were heading towards that town of Bethlehem, there were so many angels involved <clears throat> all along the way as they went back. And they were all surrounding. If, if you could see in the spirit, the whole of Bethlehem was filled with angels. Some of you say, why? Because they have been waiting for a long time to, to, to see this manifestation. And they have never seen this before. That God could come in the form of a human. So all the angels were literally watching. It was a main show in the universe. But in a natural world, when people look at Mary, they think it's just another pregnancy. God has to do that, otherwise, I would say it would be unnatural attention, which God doesn't want. He wants Jesus to grow up as a normal human being, although we know that he's super uh, above normal. So sometimes we think that when we have the Holy Spirit upon our life, that um, God will make us so visible like some of you are thinking when you're transfigured and transformed oh, from the time you know your whole house you know you can get rid of all the electric lights because you are the light <laughs> so at night when you go out oh it's glowing all the time and coming or oh, then in the daytime it might be like brighter than the sun can you imagine when you go into the MRT train everybody you know, the poor the sunglasses. And uh, some of us think that, you know, God is an attention seeker. No. For the sake of doing what God needs to do, God sometimes has the ability to hide His glory and make it invisible. So if you saw Joseph and Mary, you could feel something. That there's a lot of the presence of angels throughout all her nine months of pregnancy and up to this time but you might not be able to see anything unless of course it shows you so people around might feel a certain peace a certain love a certain presence but they will be unaware of the numerous i would say maybe the word was innumerable uh, unnumbered number of angels that were watching the whole scenery and timing for them to go back. God is watching over His Word. His Word. Cross-reference, and just on a cross-reference, even every simple word. In the Gospel of Matthew, you hear the story of the three kings from the east and uh, 
The three kings from the east are also significant because suddenly out of the blue they came, correct? We all know all the Christmas story. But many people don't realize the many prophecies about the revival of the end man coming from the east. And then suddenly they say, hey, why these three wise men? They sing it in Christmas time. But they have no understanding that these three kings also represent a type of the end time revival coming from the east. The kings came, visited, and disappeared. Myrrh, gold, frankincense was left behind. Myrrh is associated, associated with a cross. Gold is associated with provision on the earth, which in the end time revival in Isaiah 60, you got wealth. Frankincense is resurrection. So they already were prophetic typology that point to the end time. We sing it at Christmas Day. We could almost, the day will come when this revival of the end time reaches its peak. And then when we tell the Christmas story, we say, do you know why they were these kings? Not necessarily three kings, but the kings that bring three gifts. Because they're a type of what will happen in the end time revival. The multiplication of the fellowship of his sufferings, the multiplication of his provision, the multiplication of his resurrection power. And then everyone say, Ah, now we can see that it's been sung. This revival has been sung in every Christmas without us realizing. Why do three kings just, uh, 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 the kings, let's say, these uh, men from the thing, appear and disappear? And what were they known for? Nobody know which country, right? Nobody know where they were from. The only thing you know of them is this. They were wise. Which points to the end time wisdom that is also released. Wow, they were singing about this end time revival all the time without knowing. And they saw the star. Again representing the rise of the star. Uh, they start as Peter mentioned. But here, when they came naturally to the capital of Israel, they go to the capital Jerusalem. Herod was there. So they inquire, hey, where's the Christ? Where's the Messiah that we knew is going to be born? And then they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And we know this prophecy is taken from uh, Micah 5, verse 2 here, about Bethlehem. And interesting, such a little prophecy and God arranged the whole entire Roman Empire to make sure one tiny prophecy got fulfilled. God is watching over His Word. The written Word, but let me make this clear. The written Word was once a spoken Word. The only thing is it got written down. Think about it. What is the written word? The written word was once spoken word that became written down. Every story in the Bible from the book of Genesis was a real life story of God speaking the spoken word to people. That is why I mentioned not only by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The written word came from the spoken word. And as a prophet spoke the spoken word, to time it got written down because it was not fulfilled yet. And then it passed on into the ages and then it became a record and it became the written word. So you can say that all the word written and spoken was originally from the mouth of God, spoken to the prophets. And we can say, God is watching over every dust, says the Lord. That's why we cannot 
lightly use the word dust says a lot. Because when there is a dust says the Lord, God is watching away. He will move kingdoms. He will move the entire earth. He will move empires to make sure his word gets fulfilled. So all this to move Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. <laughs> Couldn't have God just spoken to them and say, hey, go to Bethlehem and give birth there. He could. But there was a prophet called Micah, a minor prophet, almost unheard of by many people. And many people don't realize this book is in the Bible. Say, turn to the book of Micah. Huh? Where? Where? Isaiah, I know. Jeremiah, I know. Ezekiel, I know. Micah? But in the tiny little book is a word spoken that says that Christ must be born in Bethlehem. And God watches the word to fulfill. This chapter 2 is full of God watching the word to fulfill. We go down all the way, uh, okay, to Simeon, just jump down in my translation, uh, Logos. Okay, go down a little bit to the dedication ceremony of Simeon. There are two people are here, Simeon. Verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting, and actually is waiting expectantly for the helper of Israel, because there's a word parakletos, but in a different way, uh, it's like help. So I put it helper, which is more correct English, and uh, uh, translated consolation is paraklesis, from parakletos of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was a spirit that he would not see, uh, he would not see death before he has seen uh, Christ <coughs> and uh, <coughs> then we okay can read his story and he came by the spirit in the temple where the parents brought in uh, uh, Jesus at that time he took him up in his arm and blessed God and said Lord now you're releasing your servant in peace according to your spoken word Rema you know that Elderly man Simeon, I saw in the spirit that he, when he was young, the word of the Lord came to him and said, You will not die until you see the Messiah. And all his life he believed that and been telling people, He will not die until he see the Messiah. And now he looks like he's almost died. <laughs> He's grown old enough for most of his peers all dying off. But he keeps telling everybody else, I will see the Messiah before I die. Which means that I will not die. The Lord said to me, I will see the Messiah before I die. So death cannot touch him. The only thing he misses was renewing of youth. But out of that, And every time there's a dust, says the Lord, there are angels watching over the word. And everything that goes against the word being fulfilled, the angels would do things. Cut, destroy, tear down, so that the word is fulfilled. Whether the word is to one man or through one man, doesn't matter the whether it's a donkey, a man, it can be even a cat if you want, a lover of cat. If the word of God came to a man, a donkey or animal, it's watched by God. Which reminds me, some of you might have the word of God coming to you and say, You will not die until you see the rapture. Make the written, the spoken word, the written word. You know how? Write it down. <laughs> so it became written word. 
as I said, spoken. Somebody wrote it down. That's why it became written word. And God has not stopped giving. That says the Lord. He still continue in the book of Acts. It ends in twenty eight. We are in Acts twenty nine. So we continue. God is still speaking the word today. And his word can come in visions, in, in sentences. But if there is a dust, says the Lord, please write it down. And in your book, differentiate between dust, says the Lord, and just normal visions or just whatever. Daniel wrote down his visions. So when the Lord said something, no heaven and earth will pass away. But not one word of the Lord will pass away until it comes to pass. I just want to quickly just show that before we go up again to the story. Okay, let's go back to the story of uh, 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 the story of uh, Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem. So there's a lot of background and all these things are happening, but the whole world doesn't know. Only two people know that there was a, the Messiah had come. Thus are many of the move of God and many are the great things of God. Now what you see of Jesus, because this end time revival is one of the closest typology of the whole thing repeated over again. That is why it starts small and it grows into its fullness, as you saw in Jesus. Of course, they had John the Baptist in the last week. And so we have that only two people know, but that was not good enough. And imagine, of all places, it was a manger and there was no room for them in the inn. And you would have thought that a manger, you know, if we were modern Christians, they might have made a gold gilded manger. All the straw would have been the best of the best of the best of the best. And they might have cleaned all the straw and, you know, polished it and all this. It was not like that. It was a simple old manger, and you and I know what a manger is. It's actually something that for, is for animals and not for humans. It's a barn. It smells of animal. Stings of animal. You don't like animal smell. And the king of kings and lord of lord, God most high, was born in an animal place. Can you imagine? Hey, that was a hospital. She gave birth there. What a place for the King of King Lord of Lord. Like you and I might feel not really appropriate when you think about the greatness of Jesus, the greatness of God. But who cares? The things of this life are nothing to the Lord Jesus. And the reason the Lord chose that, and He said, yes, the angels were also guiding. On that day, the only witnesses were all the angels of the universe, two human beings, and a couple of animals. <laughs> Maybe the cow was there. Ooh, kind of thing. That would be the way the cow worship. <laughs> or some donkeys. Or whatever, how they make the noise. I cannot make donkey noise. But all the animals were under, quote unquote, an anointed atmosphere. And when Mary gave birth, it was all supernatural. And while all the animals were well, he was shipwrecked. 
If animals could sing, they would have sang. So when the angel saw, we need, we need some more. They look around, nobody else could be there. The businessmen were too busy. The food sellers were too busy. Everybody was busy. You know, this is everybody going hometown. It will be almost a Chinese New Year, Christmas, or one of the celebrations that people have. So everybody was busy with their family, rejoicing. No human being. And the angels went out to look for human being who they could let them know. I mean, all the angels in the whole universe knew. They wanted a couple more human beings. Far, far away, they found some wise men. Those are the same wise men. But they're so far away, by the time they came, Jesus was like under two years old. And they came to a house, not a manger. A long journey. Can, can you imagine how far they are? And God revealed to them. Because the East represent the final revival. They must have people from the East represented. Hallelujah. And they found shepherds in the field, which is the next word. Next verse. As you look at the next verse, <clears throat> in the same country, shepherds were living in a field. Now, in the cross reference 63, the word living comes from a word that means that they are out in the open sky. But they are taking care of, uh, uh, of the animals and uh, sheep, especially shepherds are for sheep. And so the Greek word is talking about how they might have a simple, uh, simple surrounding shelter, but imply an open sky. So they could be looking up at the sky as they're taking care of the sheep waiting, nothing to do. Remember, everybody is busy in town. <coughs> Somebody they can take care of the sheep. So they are there waiting, looking at the sky. The Greek word imply the sky was visible. It's like living out in the open sky. So they were out living in the open sky, keeping all the other floor, and it was night time. And then the next verse says, And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them. That's word here, verse 9. And uh, I bring and say, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Let's move it up and kill all the way up. Yeah. And uh, and <clears throat> And behold, the angel stood before them, and uh, too far, too high up. Yeah. Okay. And behold, the angel, the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone round before them, and they were afraid with great fear. Now we have synchronized it, and uh, it says they were greatly afraid. When I was translating it, I said, "Hey, there is a double word for fear." There was one word for afraid, and then uh, there's a word here that means afraid, and then there was another word that they didn't translate, which is like, they were afraid with great fear, which is here the word phobos. Here's the derivation of phobos. So it's like, phobos, phobos. I said this is a, a, a derivation. And so I said, wow. There's a double word for fear. How do people translate it? And I found that they have other translations where I put in a footnote, like Mark chapter 5, and they translated it, exceedingly great fear. It was not just they were afraid. It's not like they, you know, they're lying there, waiting there, and uh, looking at the sky and the floor, because the sheep will be sleeping by them, most of them. And they were waiting in the city, everybody was busy out in the country, it was quiet. They're looking, and then the angel appear and say, you know, behold! And they look, huh? Kind of thing. No, 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 no. It says when the angel appear, 
they were exceedingly fearful. And the angel appeared and said, Behold, <laughs> kind of thing. It was like uh, uh, they were exceedingly frightened. Who knows, some of them might scream. It is the same occasion, uh, almost the same usage of words when uh, Jesus was walking on the water and uh, then everyone thought it was a ghost and they were screaming in fear. Ah! Kind of thing. And it so happened that recently in Malaysia they released a, a movie on ghosts, right? Pontiana, you call it. So, Pontiana! Kind of thing. And uh, so, it's... Uh, they were really, really, very, 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 very frightened. I could imagine that some of them were thinking of running away. And we preserved the King James. Uh, the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in sweating cloth lying in a manger. This is a Christmas story. And, and I try to preserve the whole language of it, so because it is to become a song and all that, as accurate as possible. And, and so they will see a sign of a babe in a manger. Then suddenly, there was together with them, the Together with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts. The word host means army. Suddenly, there's a lot of them. The whole sky was full of angels. Wow, can you imagine? Already they're so frightened. Then they saw the light. They're already so frightened. This angel speaking, one angel shining. Suddenly, ha, 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 ha. can you imagine? They were, you know, all frightened. Say, what about the sheep? All sleeping nicely. <laughs> Only the shepherds got frightened. So, none of the sheep got frightened. And so, a whole army, heavenly host, was visible to them, uh, praising God. And here, when they sang the song, remember we all seen the Christmas, uh, glory in the highest to God. Uh, uh. Put, put the thing over here. It is the word, uh, from the Greek doxa and uh, uh, hupsistois teo, which literally is translated, oh, glory in highest God. In highest God. Which should have been translated, glory in God most high. Again, the name of God was actually used. The name of God, and this is one of the powerful names of God, El Elyon, God Most High. Remember the angels, now I have real, realized that in the age of the angels, God's name that was revealed to them, see Yahweh, El Shaddai, all these are names that are human level revelation. In the age of the angels, God revealed himself as God Most High. And to the angels, he was actually the highest. And that was a name that angels know their God. So now you can relate better. And uh, the angels know God as God Most High. And that name came from time to time again. So the angels were worshipping because this is new to them. The God that they knew at that time was God Most High. And so they were worshipping the God Most High. All of the heaven, when Jesus was born in a manger, all the heavens and the angels said, Glory to God, Most High. You think that only when they appeared, they were singing? No! They were singing even before that, when Jesus was born. It is during this time that, that it was happening in the spirit, and they just opened the shepherd's eye for a moment. It's just like there's a whole orchestra song going on, and uh, like uh, and uh, the shepherds were just seeing the part. Mama! That's it. They only saw the little part. 
But the angels and all the spiritual realm were worshipping God Most High. All the rejoicing because throughout the whole age of the angels that lasted for a long, long time, billions of years in our time, they have been worshipping this God Most High. And suddenly, and they had a satanic rebellion. And now suddenly, this new thing that God is doing, that spells the end of Satan. The end of Satan. Now to us, human years seem long. But to them, they have been around for billions of our time. Billions of years of our time. Is spelling the end of Satan. So you can imagine all of the heaven was worshipping God most high. Because that was the God they knew. When did everything change? When Jesus rose from the dead. Philippians 2 says, God the Father says, This name Jesus is now the name above every other name. Of things in heaven, of things on earth, of things under the earth. That's where Jesus' name began to be worshipped to. After his resurrection. But before that, the worship was God Most High. That's how the angels were worshipping. <coughs> so you get a little background that glory in God Most High. And on earth, notice the word is in, not just to. Because uh, in Him they live and move and have their being. And on earth, peace, goodwill in men, not just to men. Because God was not just giving peace, God was imparting peace. That through Jesus, peace can come into you, goodwill into you. He can change bad people into good people through the born again process. God can put something into them now. And then when the angels, you can imagine, suddenly from one angel, the light came. Oh, and then they might scream, ah, boom, fall on the floor. And then the angels say, fear not, you know, and tell them there will be this sign. The moment the angels went in, the whole sky was full of angels. Oh, the angels were shaping God. And they will go, oh, and then suddenly all disappeared. Still there, but they cannot see. They were just giving a glimpse. And they were so excited, they said, we better go. So, so they were arranged among themselves, and they said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem. And see this thing, which come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. So, of course, they left one fellow behind, and the rest all went. So this group of shepherds go to town with their smell and all that. They didn't have time to bathe or change or anything. They just go in there. And then as they were going there, uh, I mean, I assume that shepherds walk in a funny way. <laughs> and they were going with all their animals and all their sticks. And then they, they look for this place. Can you imagine they got to look for the manger? And so they, they, in the end, look for the inn, find the manger, and there is this place, the old Christmas story. And you think that only one shepherd, two shepherds, only this Christmas story. No! There were a whole group of shepherds. And then they came, and then imagine Mary and Joseph there taking care of the babe, you know, must be nursing the babe, and nobody knew. This is the Messiah. And then suddenly, you got this smelly shepherd person, you know, hey, this is it. And they must be surprised. Oh, the shepherd's coming, you know. Oh, oh. What did the shepherds do? They go, oh, 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 kind of thing. And right, now, looking at a baby, well, one baby, and, but the thing is, they told Mary and Joseph about what they saw. So imagine one sign after another. But to the rest of the world, nobody knew. 
Not even the innkeeper knew what was going on in this inn. Not even the busy people in town knew what was happening. The only people who knew were Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, and a wise man who were already on their way. <laughs> took a long time. So, not many people knew of what was happening. So are the things of God. When God does something, He does it in secret. Like leaven. This is hidden and it leaven the whole lump. <clears throat> we are the salt of the earth. And as God call you, the walk that you have with God, the revelation that you have with God begin to change the things around you. And it bring you to be the head and not the tail. <clears throat> well, God comes in you. So here's the story of that. And they found uh, exactly when they seen, they make known abroad the same. They went everywhere saying, whoa, the child, the child. We saw the child. What child? What child? You know, so they started telling about this child everywhere. Everywhere they went. God could have chosen cow men. God could have chosen herdsmen to take care of pigs. But God was trying to point to every small little choice. It's a prophetic type. Because Jesus is a shepherd of his sheep. We are like sheep. So the angels have to particularly obey God, be led by God, to choose shepherds. There may be a lot of other people out in the fields at night. People taking care of horses donkeys but he must choose shepherds because everyone he chose has a prophetic message that Jesus is a shepherd of his sheep and we all become shepherds under him so everything that happened was arranged by angels a lot of it and prophetic type now if that gives us a prophetic type that is happening then we realize that the rest of the story would be prophetic types. Eight days later, <coughs> eight days later, they have to bring Jesus to Jerusalem. Because it was a custom that when the firstborn is, is uh, delivered, they must <coughs> offer to God a sacrifice on the eighth day. So in verse 21, it tells us on the eight, when the eight days were completed for the circumcision of his child, his name was called Jesus. His name given by the angel before he was conceived in a womb. And when the days of prejudication, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And something happened when Jesus gave birth and when Jesus was circumcised. In fact, that was the first time Jesus' blood was shed. Do you realize that? The blood was shed when he was circumcised. And every drop of blood he shed means something. Because in the Old Testament, for some reason, the whole process of creating babies and uh, having babies, giving birth to babies, was considered unclean. It was considered unclean. <coughs> and here when you look at purification, you wonder what purification, right? So for that, we look back in the Old Testament and uh, okay, just <coughs> In the Old Covenant, tells us here, <coughs> wait, they didn't put it in that way, okay. Let's put purification. Because it's in the Old Testament, and uh, there we go. Leviticus, we got that. This is a, the ritual after childbirth. 
it says, If a woman has conceived and born a male child, she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of a customary purity, she shall be unclean. That means her monthly period, she's unclean. On the eighth day of the flesh of his foreskin, his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall then continue in a blood purification 33 days. So you have uh, <clears throat> eight days, 33 days, that makes 41 days. Actually, it's actually 40 plus 1. She shall not touch any hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of a purification. Now, it's a female child, the un unclean is longer, twice as long, two weeks and 66 days. And uh, 66 uh, days, and uh, when, you, when you add everything together, it's 33. And um, so, when you add the seven days of a purification, uh, as before, she continued in that for 33, so 7 plus 33 is 40, and so here you got 14 plus 66, two weeks. So that would be 80 days, twice as long, a number divisible by 4. Now, when did this natural thing become unclean, correct? A woman's spirit is a natural cycle. And the same, you know, with the, with the man's uh, semen, it is a natural cycle in, in the creation of baby. Why did the Bible make it unclean? Anybody? Any guesses? Why unclean? And you and I know the Bible verse in Hebrews 13 that says, the marriage bed is holy. So, the procreation act is holy. What unclean? Right. The first time that they ever had a relationship physically, Adam and Eve, unfortunately, was after the fall. If they had a relationship before they fell, we will at least see what a glorious unfallen child would be, correct? But the first time they had it was after they already fell. And the act of procreation and the relationship of oneness between man and woman is so holy that when the fall it affects that act itself so the whole thing had to have the blood of the lamb cover to cleanse it so the whole process of giving birth because menstruation cycle is actually part of fertility that the egg is being released because it's not being fertilized it all ties to fertility same with admission from a man. It's always a tie with fertility. Why is it so unclean? Because it was done after the fall. It need redemption. And we saw it when the Lord showed. The, one of the first revelations, you remember the cube that was there, like an like a, a archive of, of revelation? was during a time, and I was staying in Clementine at that time, and the Seven Thunders uh, Prophet was there. We used to get together to download all the things. And then he was new to the cube too. He could not even find a door. And one of the first things that we were talking, God, God hear everything you talk. We were talking, and I was discussing about how, uh, how does Jesus cleanse uh, this a monthly thing that becomes so holy that, that so that in the Old Testament if a woman were having a monthly period or a man has an admission which include an actual relationship that he had with the wife cannot come to the temple it's unclean for a whole day kind of thing uh, or for a week so how do they become clean and one of the first things that we saw in the cube 
was when Jesus of Nazareth, who was created, the body was created in the womb of Mary, when Jesus passed through the womb of Mary and was given birth, it cleansed the woman's cycle. That was when the cleansing did. Because a lot of blood flow also and all those things. It cleansed the woman. From that day onwards, her monthly cycle is no more impure. That's why the New Testament changed. It cleanses the woman. It cleanses that part of the woman. And when Jesus was circumcised, on the eighth day, it cleansed the man. Because in the book, you might not realize how significant it is. But I got to cross reference another place for us to realize how significant it is. Everything in the spiritual is linked to something in the natural. So when in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, it says, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We know that is through the joining of the physical organs of the husband and the wife. So the joining of those organs, which in the human eyes is gross, gross, except in a marriage relationship. But outside of that, people think of uh, sex as a very gross thing. The devil make it unclean, impure, unholy, and perverts it. To God and Jesus is the most holy act. And when, Je and it has to be cleansed, when Jesus passed through the woman and Jesus was circumcised, he cleansed the sexual organs and he purify it as a holy act unto God it will be like you know redemption of the sexual act powerful he didn't know that that was important it is very important especially when we begin to talk about the millennium because the millennium is the place where there is procreation in a perfect environment. And I saw in the millennium that children grow up like what you wonder what will happen if Adam and Eve had procreated. Because God says, be fruitful and multiply. This is before sin came. So they were supposed to be fruitful and multiply, said so they were too busy. And in the millennium, we see that. And so there's a lot of other things to teach in that area. And one of the things is that the essence of, the, of, the, of two spirits gets into the child also. Which is why any slight imperfection will have come and passed through also, which explains the rebellion at the end of the millennium, right? At the end of the millennium, a group still follows Satan. Because you know why? Some of those in the millennium came from the tribulation saints who died. That God allowed them to have a chance in the millennium. So it's interesting that some things are passed on. We know in the natural that genetics is passed on. The child looks and have genes, a mixture of genes of the parents. There is an imperfect situation. Then based on the law that all things in the natural are pattern of things in the spiritual, can you imagine whether the spirit and soul qualities are also pass on? The answer, yes. So that's why it's a holy act, because it's an act of creation. Jesus redeem it. Hallelujah. Jesus redeem it. 
when he was born and when he was circumcised. Hallelujah to that. So finally, after a purification, which we know has to be 66 days, he was presented, uh, oh no, I tell you three days because it's a, a male child, we, a female child is 66, uh, which is actually 40 days and up, because 40 plus 1. And uh, because she's unclean for one week, no, not counting Jesus, Jesus will be circumcised uh, on the eighth day. But for her, she'll be unclean for one week plus seven days plus 33. And um, so there's 40 days altogether. And she offered this sacrifice unto the Lord. And here comes the story of two people. Remember what we're saying, everything is a prophetic type. And there was a man called Simeon. Simeon in the Hebrew means hearing. Hearing. So he was one who can hear God. And so we continue to read. Simeon was a righteous, devout, expecting and waiting for the helper of Israel. The Messiah called the helper. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And the Holy Spirit had actually revealed to him. From young, you will not die until you see the Messiah. And he held on, and he held on, and he held on, and he held on, and he never could die. One by one, all his classmates died, but he will never die. One by one, all his loved ones died, but he will never die. Because God said it. Just like some of you are holding on to the fact that God told you you will live through the rapture. So one by one, you see all your classmates die. But you say, I will never die, I'll see the rapture. And then, one by one, all your... Okay, you pray your loved ones will be in the move. But one by one, all your distant cousins and distant relatives who are not walk closely with the Lord, one by one, all go home. But you will never die because the Lord told you, you will lead to the rapture. The only extra difference is, you got restoration of youth. Amen. So, that is the word that he held to. But wait, he has to still be sensitive to hearing. Because when he came by the Spirit at that very day, it so happened to be the day that Mary gave the offering and she is purified and there will be about 40 days and she is there with the baby and here comes Simeon led by the Lord because the Lord must have told him today is the day I wonder what it was like that morning when he got up <laughs> he's been waiting if he was 90 years old He's been waiting for, let's say, God revealed to him, let's say, about 20 or 30. Okay, let's give him 30. And so, he's been waiting for 60 years. 60 years he's been waiting, waiting. The Bible did we use the word waiting, but it's more like looking for, expecting the Messiah. Messiah, Messiah. And one morning, that morning, something must have told him, today is special. Today is a special day. I mean, how nice. Imagine, the first time that we're going to see creative miracle. The first time we're going to be, I've already been transported, but the first time we can be transported by will, by choosing. Wow. Imagine what it would be like on the day that we wake up that morning. How God would tell us something. So that promise was there. And that morning he knew something was special. He knew he must go to the temple. Now he was not hanging around the temple every day. But that day, something prompted him to go. And he was led by the Spirit to the temple on the exact day, exact time. Don't forget, that is not the only, only child. 
Jerusalem. There are a lot of people who were also dedicated and purifying. But he has to be led by the Spirit to the one child. He knew this was the finale. So he held the child. He took him up in his arms and blessed God. And I'll synchronize that. And he says, now, in the old translation, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. But the actual Greek says, now you are releasing your servant. It was like, want to die cannot die. <laughs> want to go anywhere cannot go. Because he was bonded to the word. The word says, you shall not die until you see the Messiah. So the word became kept, his captive. He was held by the word. And the word held him up. That is how much a spoken word must be to you. When God speaks to you a spoken word, you and the word captures you. The word captures your life. In a way, sometimes you can say it this way. We have a choice but no choice. <laughs> because your choice is captured. Remember Paul said something like that. When he knew he must go to Jerusalem. In Acts 21, he met a group of disciples who says, Don't go to Jerusalem. The only song he keeps hearing them say, Don't go, don't go, don't go. Acts 21, you read. Some people prophesy. Don't go, don't go, don't go. Then he was in Philip's house. Their biggest prophet in town, Agabus, came, took his belt, tied himself, and prophesied. The man to whom this belt belongs will be bound in Jerusalem. So then all his friends say, Don't go, don't go, don't go! But everybody's singing the same song. Everybody don't want him to go. And Paul said, Why are you breaking my heart? I have to go, I have to go, I have to go! But the main thing he said is, I go bound in the Spirit. You notice this word? In Acts 21, this is Paul's exact words. He used this statement and said, Why do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem. For the name of our Lord Jesus. Say, so Paul knew and he was ready <clears throat> to go. And in the end, they said they could not be persuaded, and they said, The will of the Lord be done. And the first group was there in verse 4. The disciples who he stayed with for seven days, they said, Told Paul not to go. But Paul was determined. He knew that he must go even if he's captured. It was a part of God's will that uh, God was working through. So, the word that Simeon used is strange. It's like Simeon was bound to the spoken word he received. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4 verse 4, from Deuteronomy chapter 8. What is a spoken word to you? 
Is it a suggestion? Is it something that you just keep aside? Or is it something when you know that it's of God that changed your entire life? Where your life is tied with it. Remember, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That means that you now live by the word. Like if you live by eating, you eat the word. The word is now your life. The Word is your daily source of your life. Your life is bound to the Word. You live and die by the Word. You live and die literally by the Word. Only people to that extent can bring forth the spoken Word in their life. If Simeon were not bound or sensitive to the word, he might have died without it being fulfilled. See, there is an obedience on the side of human too. God will watch over the word. What does it mean by God watch over the word? It means circumstances that you cannot control. He will control for you. Circumstances that is in your control, you have to obey. The Holy Spirit cannot force Simeon to go to the temple. He has to obediently hear and go to the temple that day. He has to walk to the temple. That's how the spoken word came to pass. If he was not bound to the word and he was doing some other thing and don't care, he said, oh, the word is a word, it will come to pass by itself. In a way, yes, there is. We need, we need for example, to have that carefree and worry-free attitude of not being too stressed to fulfill the word in your own strength. Otherwise, you get an Ishmael. But at the same time, you need to have the word bound into you where you are willing to fulfill what God told you to do, whatever the cost. For Paul, it cost him his freedom. That's how you're bound to the word. And then the word can come to pass. Jesus was like that in his entire life. Later we see. He's led by the word. He says he will not do anything unless the Father show him. The word was important to him, the spoken word. So we have a man, like Simeon says, Now your word is fulfilled. I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to leave this earth and go home. That's why he says, I'm now released. And he gave uh, a blessing to Mary. Uh, and Joseph and then he also prophesied for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all peoples a light uh, unto the revelation of the nations now the word Gentiles is actually the Greek word nations so I'm going to use that because it applies to all nations uh, and, uh, and it's been translated nations in some places but it's been translated Gentiles for some reason uh, because when it comes to the Jews but now we're in a nation so when you look at it a light unto revelation of the nations it's like a revelation and a light will come to the nations and the glory of your people Israel so it's like from the day that Jesus was born he was preparing for Acts chapter 60, a light to the nation. Because, uh, not actually, uh, Isaiah 60, sorry. Isaiah 60, arise shine, for your light has come. So it started from the day he was born. And 2,000 years of church revival is bringing the fullness of Jesus to the nations. That light has become Pergamos glory and is now affecting the whole planet. That glory 
is gone into the earth and changing the earth by Gamma's glory. And Joseph and his mother marvel at these things. I forgot to put a capital H here, I'll put it in the revision. At those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the downfall and resurrection of many in Israel. In the old translation, <clears throat> you have here, Behold, this child is destined. And, uh, <clears throat> but the word destined is the word set. That means laid. Uh, the path is set for the downfall and the resurrection of many in Israel. It's beginning to release this resurrection power. It's not as translated that the fall and rising of many. Rising who? Who does Jesus want to promote now? Now that he's final, when I look at the word rising, I say, you know, fall and rising is like promotion in the natural world, correct? But now that Jesus has come, what says he want to promote? Because he is the final kingdom. Do you realize that his kingdom is the final kingdom? Our earth has been ruled by kingdoms. All the way from the time of uh, recorded history, from the Mesopotamian era, on the way to Egyptian, and then uh, Syrian, Assyrians, and uh, Israelite, and then for all the other kingdoms, and then our modern history, empires, uh, have risen and fallen and then even though it's a democratic democracy you have people try to conquer the world explore you know the the French Revolution and, the, uh, and then you have uh, British Empire you have uh, the influence of the USA today the world has always been needing empire do you know Jesus is a final the last and the final according to Daniel chapter 2 the stone that finishes everything. The finale. So, what rising is it? What, what, what other empire is going to promote? No more. It's the resurrection. But interesting, there's a division. The moment Jesus comes, you're either cast out or you're in. There is no more middle ground. Immediately, he says, even from the day he is born, a division has come. Those who are for the devil, who are on the fallen angel side, the angels who have rebelled, and those who are on God's side, there is no more gray line. And he will be a sign spoken against. The word spoken against is a word contradicted. That means when Jesus comes, people will contradict him and not accept him. Every time the truth comes, people are challenged to believe or to not believe. That's why you got to check it with a written word and check it in your heart when it's in line with uh, the character of Jesus and the love of God and the peace and the joy as well as the spoken word that God has given. Written word, spoken word, every area we check. But it is a dividing line. And then, it says, Yea, a sword shall pass through or pierce through your own soul also. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Everyone will be exposed. Simeon means hearing. The second person who saw baby Jesus, who the Lord prepared, was Anna, and that's a shortened form of the word Hannah. It's originally from Old Testament Hannah, which means grace. So immediately, the two people who are blessed by baby Jesus, before Jesus could speak one word, this is just a baby. He could not even, he might not even stretch hands there. Or bless them. He's just a baby. But the two people who were really blessed straight away is one who hears and one full of grace. 
The only two ways, and you can look at it in this way. Sometimes Jesus comes to us. Sometimes Jesus is just with us. But the blessing is always to those who can hear and to those who have the grace. Anna means grace. A prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, and, and that is a tribe of full of blessings also. You know, bread and Asher is a tribe that produce bread. Nothing is a coincidence. Remember, from the time he chose the shepherds to come, every person he chose to welcome Jesus in his childhood is chosen. And what is the tribe of Asher? Well, let's look at the blessings on Asher and um, Genesis 49 and Deuteronomy 33. Asher Verse 20, remember I said bread from Asher? Bread from Asher shall be rich and he shall yield royal dainties. He will serve with the kings. Supply the king's dainties or delicacies. In chapter 33 of Deuteronomy, in Moses' blessing and revelation, it tells us <coughs> of Asher in verse 24. And of Asher, he says, Asher is most blessed of his sons. Most blessed. All the blessings are there. Remember, Hannah's name means grace. Fanuel means face of God. Let him be favored by his brothers. Let him dip his foot in oil. Your sandals shall be iron and bronze. As your days, so shall your strength be. There is no one like the God of Jeshuron. One of the names of God who rides the heavens to help you. And in His excellency on the clouds, the eternal God is your refuge. Underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy. Then Israel shall dwell safely, in safety, the fountain of Jacob alone, in a land of grain and new wine. Now, grain and new wine, and you look, points again to the book of Revelations. Remember, touch not uh, that. And he anointed uh, before the enemy can come. His heavens shall also drop dew. Happy are you, Israel. So Asher is a final blessing. And you can see that occur. So there we have Anna, another chosen vessel. She was another of great age. As we see, she lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. That means it was, uh, you know, only seven years. Uh, then her husband died, and she spent the rest of her life as a widow. And she was by now about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, serve God with fastings and prayers night and day. So she spent her whole life in the temple. Always, every day she's there, serving God. She's a prophetess, as he said. And she, coming in the instant, right at the same time, the temple was very big. Just after Simeon had just blessed, she come in right at the time, led by the Spirit, and she spoke of him to all those who were again, expecting and waiting for redemption in Jerusalem. What an exciting thing. Even though the whole world doesn't know, you have Mary, Joseph, exciting time for them. The shepherds, the wise men who unfortunately got a long journey, which is a type of us in the last days. <laughs> long journey, far, far place, way from the east. So the east came, and then the east went back. And then the glory of God now goes to the east, which is where we are today. We are right in the far east. And uh, 
So there is Simeon, there is Anna, and you look at that. These are quality chosen stock. God is not interested in the quantity. He was always interested in the quality. That's why at the end of the millennium, before Satan came and was released to tempt everyone, because no one has seen Satan, he locked up for 1,000 years in the millennium. It is not when he came that they turned back. When he came, whatever was inside was revealed. He could have stopped Satan and never let Satan in. And those people, because of being surrounded by this goodness and presence, will have remained. Do you know that he could have taken the whole group if Satan didn't come? Look very carefully at Revelations. I show you the finale of the human race, which is in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. There's the thousand years. And set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a little while. And then here's, that's why those in the millennium, they get into the thousand years, he says. The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So he says, uh, <clears throat> I saw thrones and then I saw those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, and they live and reign with Christ a thousand years. And it says, Blessed and holy is he who is part of that, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Then the sad news, verse 7, when the thousand years were expired, Satan was released, and then he went out and he again deceived. And the only people who were there were the people in the thousand years. If God was interested in quantity, he would not have released Satan. But Satan was released to separate those who still got Satan in their hearts. And those were removed and thrown back in quantum time to the seven years, leaving only the quality people. When one third of the fallen angels fell, it tells you something. God was only interested in quality angels. God is always interested in the quality. Because here's the thing. Quality is what God is after. Of course, He wants quantities of quality things, quality people. The more that can be saved, the better. But He always still wants quality. So at the beginning of Jesus coming, when He was still a child, these are all quality people. Even the shepherds he chose were very good. They went out and keep talking about Jesus, about what they saw. The wise men, they were quality people. The wise men were all definitely safe. How many of you believe the wise men who came were safe? Of course. Right? Don't tell me they come and see Jesus, then they went back, then they all died, went to hell. <laughs> Cannot be. Then the Christmas story very funny. Yes. In this case, the Simeon and the Anna, are they the calendar event? Because you see, uh, people in the past, they know how to look at the star, and they also... Yes, you're right. They, the conservation... Correct. You know, they, they sort of like... Um, okay. They are the calendar event. That means that when they were alive, ah. as long as they are alive, you will live to see Jesus, the Messiah come. So only after they die, then you know the Messiah is already in town. They were calendars in their own right. To those online who cannot hear, I know they cannot hear properly. Uh, the question is asked whether 
uh, CMIN and ANA were calendar events. And yes, they are calendar events. But it's important for us to understand that the spoken word is important. To Simeon and Anna, they are just one of the multitudes in Israel. To many people, some of you are the multitudes of the Christian. But there is a difference. You have a rhema. If God has spoken a rhema to you, let the rhema, now you learn one thing tonight, be bound to you. Be bound to you. So that you shall live only by the rhema. By the rhema alone do you live. And you wake up every day is, and you want to live because God promised you. You live for that promise. And the good news, it won't take as long as Simeon and Anna. <laughs> you won't have to wait under your 84 years or 90 years. 100 years. It's already happening in your eyes. Antichrist was born in 2015. False prophet in 2004. And we have entered a place of this end time revival with Pergamos Glory in February 9, 2012. Already year by year, a lot of changes are happening year by year. And we are in the first cycle of the first seven years. There are only seven cycles. We are in this end time. But notice, Anna is one who serves with fasting and prayers night and day. I would say if she serves God with fasting and prayer night and day, she don't eat very much. I would assume that she is quite a skinny little woman. Because it's fasting and prayer, what do you expect? What do you expect a good chubby woman to come and prophesy and carry Jesus? No, she's fasting a lot. She's not been eating and drinking. So, she was led by the Lord to come in and she spoke of him and prophesied. Finally, the family returns and they did everything and they went back to Nazareth and the child grew and became strong in spirit but what we have is this part is the same like John the Baptist the child grew and was strengthened with force in the spirit up to that part all this extra part is Jesus that John did not have he was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. The spirit of wisdom occupied him from his birth. Spirit of wisdom came upon him, attached itself upon him. And this is the one thing we must understand. It is not that you know a lot of things, then you have wisdom. No, it's wisdom come then you know a lot of things. Same like you see in Solomon, <clears throat> although he didn't have revelation, it was when the spirit of wisdom came, then he understood about birds, plants, animals, and all those things. See, the spirit of wisdom comes, then the intelligence comes. Intelligence follow the spirit of wisdom. So the most important thing is to have the spirit of wisdom. And you can see the spirit of wisdom in 12 years in a perfect environment. Of course, Jesus, because he was perfect. By the time he was 12 years old, and every year they went to the Feast of Passover, suddenly the record goes to his 12 years old, he was 42. When he was 12 years old, he talked about one incident in his life. An incident that shows the maturity of Jesus, powerful maturity of Jesus, because the spirit of wisdom was upon him. Some of you have received the spirit of wisdom and you're thinking, you know, why am I not like Solomon yet? You know, I read, 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 blah, 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 everything, blah, blah. You need to allow it time to soak into you. Soak into you. 
and as the spirit of wisdom comes, it will give you an intelligence beyond your years. One of the things that we need to understand about Jesus is he has to learn everything from scratch. The Hebrew language, counting, human. I mean, it must be quite fascinating to see Jesus starting from scratch. Give up everything and start from scratch. To a certain extent, all of us did it. Because all of you had a pre-existence in God. You were sent by God to be born on earth with a mission. But there was one requirement. Most of your memory is wiped out. So you forgot almost everything. Jesus recovered it. Because when he was an adult, he says, Before Abraham was, I am. So then he went, you know, even, you know, 40 years old, you want to talk about you before Abraham because he knew who he was. And it's up to us to recover that, to know who we are. And your mission before you came. <clears throat> All of you didn't look like what you look like before you came because you were not human. But when you're born, you have some of your parents' characteristics as your in a physical body and some soul qualities some spiritual qualities, strengths and weaknesses and you took on all those things but there's a part of you that came from heaven I like, remember I used the word most of your memories are wiped away not all of them you're allowed to retain some that will remind you of who you are after coming to know the Lord, walking with Him when I think back about my early days before I met Jesus, I remember there were a few times that when I was in the early years, when I was probably 10 years old or 11, I was old enough to walk on the ledge kind of thing. And I remember looking up and say, I feel strange, I feel like I don't belong here. You know? So that strangeness, and I, I somehow I believed that there was a God. Nobody taught me. And I say, I always say, no, there's a God out there, you know, I, I, I want to get to know this. And so, there is strange, you have, you have episodes of time when you recall that you came to earth for a reason. But the sad thing is many people got lured away by this earth. Abraham Chan had a vision, I think one of the early downloads that he had when he, was, he remembered himself in heaven and a lot of the people coming down and he saw how the people come and then he saw that everyone was very eager to come but when they came there was a lot of people who forgot why they came and they went astray into this earth and it was sad when he was seeing it and so people need to be reminded unfortunately we need to be reminded by people on earth just like Lazarus uh, uh, and the rich man and the rich man after both died and Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom rich man say you know hey uh, send Lazarus you know to tell my other family so that they don't come here or and then the father Abraham told him this they have the scriptures and they have the prophets let them listen to them they don't need someone come from the dead to tell them so we have the scriptures and we are men and women of God. Men and women of God who God assign, who God give visions, who God give experiences to tell you that Jesus is real. For me, I can stand here and say even without the Bible, I know Jesus is real because I'm one of those who have witnessed Jesus after his resurrection. I met with Jesus, I've seen Jesus. I bear witness, he is alive. So he sent men and women unto us to tell us that there is a God. So they had the scriptures and they had the prophets. Abraham said, same with us today, that all of us came for a reason. So you thought Jesus had to re learn everything. We, he is a pattern. We have to learn everything. And we have to come to the place of knowing who we are. At 12 years old, Jesus already recovered everything. He knew who he was. And so one day, he says, 
when they were in Jerusalem when he was 12 years old and they thought that Jesus was with one of these uncles, aunties or family and they travel as a group, the family from Nazareth, Nazareth to Jerusalem is a long long distance take many, many days journey so when they left for one whole day uh, it says here they went a day journey then they looked for him and they cannot find Jesus then they realized we left him behind we left him behind and when they, they found him not they turned back to Jerusalem and let's look onwards and then when they came back it took them three days to find him all together four days he was left alone after three days when they returned they found him in a temple sitting in the midst of the teachers both hearing them and asking them questions slightly different from all the transition but not much they say he's listening and ask, asking them questions because the spirit of wisdom was in him and when they heard they were amazed at his understanding and answers that means he actually was able to answer the questions he asked and he was there in a temple you know where Jesus was in all those four days one day journey and then now if they went one day journey and they came back one day that is actually two days then plus three days looking for him there will be five days where did Jesus sleep? who fed him? he was just in the temple and he just hang around with this gentleman he's 12 years old all these are teachers who might be uh, to be one of the rabbis in those days you might be 50 to 70 to 80 years old and this is young boy sitting in the middle of them surrounded by these people and they must have been fascinated and they must be taken their home someday all oh, the five days that he was missing he might have been taken to some of their homes he might have ate with some of them because they're fascinated they don't know where this boy comes from where is his parents but he, he knows a lot he was asking them questions that they could not answer and then he answered it himself then he asked some questions and then he asked something oh this, this they were fascinated they must have fed him to kill him in those days and he would continue and continue there happy as he is until his mother came mama came and her father also came of course and then his mother is the one who said to him son what have you done to us behold your father and I saw you and here's the actual word anxiously there in anguish O King James in sorrowing we are crying oh, where's my son oh, where's my son that is actually the situation she thought she lost him forever hey think about it here we know the story that she found him, correct? But she doesn't know the story that she's going to find him. Right? So, when he was missing, from the day that they realized he was missing, one day out, she already crying. Oh, and these are the thoughts that some of you might be in the situation. I say, oh, I gave birth to Messiah. I lost the Messiah. <laughs> Messiah. Oh, what happened? Someone kidnapped him. On, on the Messiah. Oh, Messiah. What oh, the Messiah? Oh, the Messiah who came out from me. Ah, ah, ah. There was a situation. Why do you think she calmly? In, when you read the story, you thought she calmly come. Sang what you done to us. Hmm? Come on, come. Hmm. What? She was in an anguish. Crying her eyes out. That whole night, the first night she was missing. I wonder whether Joseph had to be hugging her and say, It's alright. 
You know what I mean? She would say, oh, the Messiah, gone, gone. I carried for nine months. And you said, take care. I didn't take care. Ah. And you know, maybe they had an overnight crying. Not overnight prayer, overnight crying. And so they go weeping and crying all the way back. Three days looking high and low. You know how three days looking, that means three days really looking, correct? So they must turn looking under every stone, literally. Looking into every house. Have you seen the boy this height? Have you seen my son? Have you seen? They must go back to the inn where they came, where they might have stayed. Where make the people they know. Have you seen? No. Ah! Ah! Three days crying. Until she finally saw him in the temple, you no, know, crying. Huh? There's this group gathering. You know, in the temple can have gathering. You see them gathering, 3,000 in the temple. So the temple is very big. So this is this group of old elderly rabbi, you know, lawyers and, 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 and teachers. Teachers! Special idea. All older people. What's this gathering? And there's one voice talking that sounds familiar. <laughs> and she go near, there's Jesus. By that time, she got no words to say. Because she must have heard everything. How he talked. And then she was sick. Eh? Go, you know, finally, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me again. Pull Jesus up. And then it's almost like blaming him. You know, and saying, you know, what have you done this to us? <laughs> and so, in the end, Jesus answered, Why did you seek me? Did you not see that I must be about my father's business? Actually, this is quite hard to translate because this, like, my father's, uh, my father's about kind of thing. So there's no word to translate that. I want to put things, but the word things has been neuter. So it's not. So in the end, I leave it as it is. About my, and the business is like a busyness, everything about the father. So about my father's things, or my father's business. And they don't understand him. They did not understand the rhema which he spoke to them. Even what he spoke was still rhema. He says, spoken word. <clears throat> and can you imagine growing up with parents who do not understand who you are? Working for people who do not understand who you are. Submitting to them is still the quality of Jesus. I think it's very hard to submit. Tough. Because he not only know more, he know millions of times more. And everything they do, everything they say, by that time he knew everything. It must have been difficult. It is almost like you are Leonardo da Vinci. And you're learning how to, they teach you how to paint. And that your teacher is a little child, 10 year old, who cannot even do crayon properly. That's not easy. But it says, he went down with them, came to Nazareth, was subject. The word subject is submissive to them. But his mother, that you, Mary was a thinker. I remember I asked, told you before. She's the only one who dialogismos. So the same thing. She kept all this rhema in her heart. She's always pondering. And later on, you know, she's always pondering and thinking about all these things. She's always reason. She's quite actually Mary probably in those days the women don't have much education. She probably is a very intelligent and thinking woman. Very clever. And uh, <clears throat> uh, and he says, Jesus, okay, let me cross-reference uh, to the whole thing. And he says, 
Jesus advance and it says that increase but I instead of the word engage that one because it's the word Greek word for moving forward in leaps and bounds so you had to picture the leaps and bounds so he advanced in wisdom in stature and in grace with God and man do you notice something wisdom can continue to increase and grow in you even though he was already filled with wisdom it was increasing as he was increasing it's a lot to the spirit of wisdom the stature is talking about physical height growing and in grace with God and man he knew exactly how to relate to people so he knew how to handle all relationship could you imagine Jesus grew from one years old all the way to 30 years old when he began to be independent in his ministry we know definitely that when he started his ministry he know how to relate to everyone but this was tell you even when he was growing from one year old two year old three year old four year old twelve years old thirteen years old fourteen years old twenty years old onwards he knew how to relate to all human beings he might have customers in a shop carpenter shop and the one thing we know Jesus worked as a carpenter and we saw the two bag in vision he carry like you know like a pouch bag and in the pouch bag it was like made of brown leather that was the one he, he traveled with uh, he did not carry it when he started the ministry but he carried when he was in his auto building trip in his 20s and he was a carpenter and he has these carpenter tools that were there in his pouch and he carried it and uh, then when he he would go to a house and he would check the house whether they need any carpentry work and if we need uh, he doesn't want payment he will work for lodging and food he did, and Jesus never once used money in all his 30 years I salute Jesus I mean never it was like he knew he was consecrated and money is invented by men heaven doesn't use money it was like you know, and those who you hear this word doesn't mean that everyone you cannot use one here, right? I'm talking about Jesus. He, he was special and he was like, he lived his life just fully for God and he never worried about the next day. So when he finished his job and all those things, sometimes he's allowed to stay longer and especially during his, in his 20s when he went about, because this is a story of Jesus, so I add the vision story to what you don't have in the Bible you'll wonder what happened when he was in his 20s right so Jesus went back and he and he stayed and submit to them and work when he was about 25 onwards he started his first altar building journey and he went to secretly watch all his future disciples he observed them from a distance so he purposely traveled to those places, plus he went to those same places that Samuel and Elijah built altars, and he built altars throughout all of Israel. Like Abraham did, so he did. And as he traveled from place to place, all he needed was his carpenter tools, and he don't need money, he just go and depend on the father. And the father will sometimes lead him to a house that has a job for a carpenter and he would say do you have something that need carpentry and the person would say yes and then he say I work all I need is food doesn't want payment then he would repair a table or a chair and then if he was not staying the night he would tank and then he go to the next place that's all he worked for really really simple life and he knew how to relate to all men courteous polite and he was already the Messiah even before the public knew he was a Messiah remember by the time 
God says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He hasn't even started his ministry. He just been baptized by John. So God was well pleased with his life from one year old to 30 years old. He never spoke a wrong word. Never make a mistake. Never hurt anyone. Never had a wrong relationship. Wow. 30 wonderful years that Jesus had. So he went for his altar building trip. Then he came back. Spent time with his family and mother by the time because the father had gone home. Then he went again, the second one. And then the third one, before, just before he turned 30. And then he said goodbye to all his mother before he left a final time and never came back for the three years at the age of 30. The final time was when he left, when you see next, uh, the next chapter in chapter 3, when he left for the ministry. And that's when the mother has now come to him because he continued in his ministry that the Lord has. His preparation years. And that's important for us to learn from him. What have we learned from this chapter? Quality people. Spoken word to be bound in it. Hearing God. Being full of grace. And the chosen people who have taught the wise men, the shepherds, Simeon, Anna, who share in the joy of Joseph and Mary. The wise man is so different from the shepherds, from Simeon, from Anna. But they're all the same. They met Jesus when he was a child. Before the whole world knew about him, these people knew who he was. You are those who are the batch that have come in in the first wave. The first seven years is the first wave. Each of these seven times seven years, you got a different wave of people. You're in the first wave group before the world comes to know this move in bigger picture. The second seven years is when the whole world will know. But you're in the first wave. Blessed are ye by the Lord. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, what a privilege to see that even in the life of Jesus, there is prophetic things of this end time. We see how, O oh Lord, that people who hear you are set apart from the whole world. The whole world are the hustle and bustle of this life. They do not know who Jesus is, do not know of spiritual things. But those who have an ear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That we are those who hear you. Thus we can overcome. Thus, we can grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Take these, O oh God, those who are here and those online, who have come to this move, and take us higher into the spirit of wisdom. Let this Pergamos glory grow and fill the whole earth through our lives that we dedicate to you, Father. We bless you. Your will and not ours be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all rise together.
deeper, higher. And higher and higher, we saw year by year. Day by day, month by month, week by week. In fastings, in prayer, sometimes in feastings, we rise higher and higher by your word. We are bound to your word. We go bound in the spirit by your word, Lord. Because your spoken word is our bread and our life. Let your will always be done in our lives and help each one to recover the mission and the memories that you have implanted in our DNA as to what we are to do on this earth. Thank you, Father. Let your will always be done. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Give you a good clap offering. <laughs>